morning, everyone. I'm Ann Trenvik, and I would like to get us started with our first Sunday um, adult education program. If you are interested in being at the program, please uh, refill your coffee as needed. And otherwise, this is your time to exit um, so that we can introduce our speaker and get on with the program. We will be taping this, so it will be available online in case you have friends or relatives that didn't get to hear this. Um, you can let them know that within a few days, Dennis, right? Yeah. He, he will have it online. Thank goodness for Dennis. Let's give him a round of applause. Hey. Um, Harold Erickson and I are the, the two reasons, uh, the two people that put these, yeah, it's our fault, yeah, uh, for bringing up these topics, coming up with these topics. Um, and uh, today's topic is on natural burial. Um, it, it's for a couple reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, you know, there's two things in life we can count on, taxes and death. And so here we are. Um, we're going to cover one of them. Um, but we also know that the process of burial um, is, is under some change. And some of it is for the, uh, protecting the earth. Um, I am part of our committee that is um, Care of Creation and the Garden Committee. And one of the things that's uh, become really apparent to me, especially as I was reading the materials preparing for today and meeting with our speaker, Joan, is the um, contamination of our earth from the processes that we've been using for many, many decades. And so she will talk about that in her presentation, but it's, it's part of the care of creation um, theme and way to, and understanding as our church community about what we're called to do as a faithful community. So Joan is um, our speaker today, Joan Giesig. She's the executive director of Catholic Cemeteries. Harold and I met with her at one of the, um, her office in, at the cemetery in um, Invergrove Heights last fall. It was an amazingly beautiful day to be at a cemetery. And um, the cemetery that she is going to talk about is the natural cemetery. And it was full of wildflowers. And it was one of the more beautiful places I'd seen in the Twin Cities. So um, we have our... Uh, booklets. If you didn't get one today, I'm sorry, if you didn't get one the last time you were at our first Sunday, we are um, in the process of having them printed again because we ran out. So we will have them for our next month's program. And next month's program is um, on the first Sunday, of course, March 6th with Professor Rolf Jacobson from Luther Seminary. He's talking about the Ten Commandments, not just for children anymore. We had Rolf last year, and he's quite a um, fun, um, well-informed, well and very experienced speaker. So I hope you will join us for that on March 6th. And then we have two more. Um, we end, our final two will be April 3rd. Another uh, Luther Seminary um, professor uh, Alan Paget, The End and Beginning, Science and Scripture, another provocative topic. And May 1st, Peter Ritchie. He's the executive director of the Robbinsdale History Museum. It is our 100th year anniversary in 2022 at Elam. And we wanted to get a perspective of how Elam has been in our community since uh, our beginning. So we're excited to have Peter Ritchie give us uh, some history of Robbinsdale and how Elam has been part of this community. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joan Giesick, our speaker today. So, I put together some packets, and on the left side of the packet, I have uh, put together a copy of all the slides. So if any of you wanted to take notes, 
Uh, I'm not going to be reading slides to you. I'm going to be talking about uh, the slides. And if you wanted to take notes on it, that would be a good place to do that. So I come from the Catholic Christian tradition, but basically when we talk about natural burial, natural burial, I'm just going to speak from the general Christian tradition, which is all of our tradition. It's very scriptural. So basically, right in Genesis, it talks about that we come from the earth. God created us from the earth. And of course, we return to the earth when we die. We also have a reference that Jesus actually was buried by natural burial. This was the way in the Middle Eastern countries that they buried. They basically uh, you were buried before sundown, and the Jewish community still practices this. But you were wrapped in linen or some other um, fabric, and aromatic spices were placed around the body, and the body was wrapped. It usually was put in a tomb, and it was left there until the body decayed and all you had were bones left. And then the bones were removed and put in a small box called an ossuary. And then it was placed in a graveyard or a, an area that would hold graves. Sometimes they were in buildings and were shelved. Other times they were buried. So natural burial is not something new. Natural burial was the way to bury pretty much until the Civil War. But I'm going to, before we get to the Civil War, I'm just going to talk about the environmental piece. Um, one of the reasons we are so interested and excited about natural burial is because of the effect that it has on the climate. It does not add to climate change. So when Pope Francis came out with the encyclical Laudato Si, he talked about how we are called to be in a better relationship with the environment and with the earth and that we actually have a responsibility for the earth. Natural burial helps us fulfill that stewardship of the earth, uh, where we are not adding anything to the earth that would be disruptive or harmful to it. And we have that responsibility as I said, it is we are an essential part of keeping the earth in its best state. We were entrusted with this uh, at creation, and we are now starting to take this more seriously. So I'm going to skip that. So there aren't restrictions. Uh, I don't know of any Christian restrictions around natural burial. There are three main components for why natural burial is good. And it's because it shows reverence for the body. It also shows that we are part of God's creation. Uh, we, we believe, Christians believe, that all of us have the breath of God in this body that we were given, that we were created with. And we also believe in the resurrection of the body. We have no idea what that's going to look like, but we know that 
our bodies are important. They have housed God's spirit, and they will be important when God comes again. We also know that everything is connected. So everything that we do has a ripple effect. And we have seen this with all of the information that science has been showing us around environmental effects and how we are in the midst of climate change. And I know that there's a lot of people that don't believe that, but we do. We believe that we are intricately connected with everything that has been created by God. So what is natural burial? Natural burial has three top characteristics. First of all, there is no vault. Almost all cemeteries require that a concrete vault is put into the earth. It is not necessarily to protect the body. It was simply to stabilize the grave. So it would keep the grave from collapsing inward. The second thing that it does is that it makes caring for the lawn or the grass easier because when a vault is put on top, I mean, when the lid is put on top of the vault, the earth does not sink down as it naturally would if there was no vault to hold the ground up. A lot of this did not take place till um, actually more of I think the Victorian times when they started looking at cemeteries as parks. The second thing for natural burial is that there is no preservation of the body with formaldehyde. Now formaldehyde of course was used, it was begun in the Civil War. Actually they used mercury first and then moved to formaldehyde. But the Civil War, when actually bodies were left out on the battlefields, that was when, and people wanted their, the bodies to come back home, to be transported home and buried in the family cemetery because most people had farms or estates or um, so many acres and a section of that was usually the family cemetery. So in order to transport the body, it needed to have embalming fluid. It's not natural. Um, it is simply to preserve the body so that it is not disintegrating or starting the decomp process. The third, but there is go back, there is a way of doing embalming with natural burial where it is a plant-based embalming fluid. So it is non-toxic to the earth and it allows a person to be viewed um, if they wanted to do a viewing or a wake or a prayer service with the body present. And funeral directors will know what that is. And the third thing for natural burial is that it is done, um, you can be in a container, but it has to be out of purely organic material. So it could be in a casket that is all wood. However, no glue can be used unless it is a natural wood. A lot of the caskets that I've seen done are tongue and groove so that they are simply put together so that they're stable enough. There is no metal. All the handles um, are in, somehow incorporated into it. Uh, you also have 
uh, in the, the bottom uh, lower right, uh, these are woven caskets. So they can be made out of seagrass, they can be made out of bamboo, there are certain grasses and materials that are grown that can, that are not uh, deforesting the earth. So those are often done. Uh, body can also be simply shrouded, that is wrapped in linen or some other biodegradable material. Linen is most often used because it's natural and it decays easily. So a standard burial, as I said, it has a vault in it. It also has um, the casket. Oftentimes you have caskets that are made out of steel or metal or something. In the end, everything will degrade over a long enough time. However, people had the impression that if I have something that will not um, leak or something where nothing will seep in, that my body will not be eaten by bugs, eaten by worms. Well, it happens eventually because nothing is there forever. Concrete itself degrades. So uh, people might think that they're safe from the natural process that comes with death, but it's not true. Um, also, you usually have to go six feet down for a regular burial, and this is to accommodate the vault. With a natural burial, you can go um, as low as three feet, and it is a, a good burial. We tend to dig four feet, just because it's a, it's a, a good amount, and then we can put the majority of the uh, soil back in, and it won't be, uh, it'll naturally go down. There are types, so we hear about green burial and natural burial, but there are a variety of ways that this could be uh, talked about. So a hybrid burial ground is a regular cemetery. However, in that regular cemetery, they may have regular burials with vaults, but maybe in between, they may do natural burial that has no vault. Um, and they also can use biodegradable containers. So a hybrid cemetery um, is, what it would be something like uh, the one in Brooklyn Center, I believe Roselawn in St. Paul is a hybrid cemetery, although the one in Brooklyn Center has been uh, certified by the Natural Burial Council. It has, uh, to be certified by them, you need to have gone through a study of the property, um, noting what how uh, nature and how the environment is protected. Uh, it's a, a long, several page document where you have to document what you do. So not all cemeteries are going to do that because they can't fulfill all of the requirements for it. A natural burial ground is one that could be in a regular cemetery. Resurrection Cemetery, where I am, we have 300 acres in that cemetery. However, 
the section that is natural burial is 30 acres that is nowhere near the regular conventional part of the cemetery. It's designated as a green natural cemetery. So we will never do anything but green burial in that section. So we have with a natural burial ground, often you will find that there will not be any markers on the, the grave unless maybe it is, um, it might be a stone that you found in the woods from the area. So places in South Carolina do that. We are a wild flower prairie restoration area. So we have nothing on the graves because it is a prairie, a natural prairie. Um, and I will show you later how we memorialize names. So, and then you've got a conservation burial ground. So this usually means that it, someone has it in trust um, by law, the money that goes into that cemetery must maintain the conservation efforts in making sure that that is con continued in the same way. So they have uh, the money going in, goes in to preserve the land in that area. Now there is one place that has started, I think it's close to Stillwater, and it's been advertising, uh, might be Prairie Oak, I can't remember. The fees are very high, and they only do cremated remains. Um, we'll get into cre is our cremated remains uh, environmentally correct versus full body natural burial, but they only do cremated remains. Their fees are high because uh, they are just beginning to develop that land trust. So uh, that would be something, always look into what is it that the cemetery is saying it's doing. So each cemetery can define the spectrum of green that they want. So sometimes if you are looking at something that fulfills the Green Burial Council, they use native grasses, native wild flowers, um, no invasives, and you are not planting anything in that area that does not actually exist as part of that landscape. You do not water it. It's watered by the rain. God takes care of it. If God lets it go, that's, there's nothing wrong with that because some plants and grasses can only um, propagate if they are in a drought. So last year when we had um, so many dry days, we now have plants that had seeded and will actually help our uh, prairie area because they wouldn't have seeded if there wasn't a drought. So it's not, it's not watered. You will not see a sprinkler. You will not see anything out there. There will be no grass treatment, no flower treatment, no fertilizers, nothing that could affect the earth. So it really is natural. There is uh, no traditional mowing. So for example, with ours being a prairie, usually it is mowed maybe once or twice a year, and that is only to spread the seeds. And there's a certain way that they mow. Every five to six years, we need to do a prairie burn. And again, because heat 
will release the seeds from certain plants that normally would not happen. We are, because we are not experts in, in maintaining a prairie, we engage a group called Prairie Restoration. So they come out every year, they check on what is happening. Last year, they decided not to mow because of the drought. Um, and they showed us the flowers that would begin to flourish because of the drought. Um, the year before, they actually mowed twice because we had quite a bit of rain. But again, it was to spread the seeds. They also, we allow them to remove invasive species. Uh, if they do any kind of uh, removal, it is done naturally. If they use any kind of treatment, they are all chemicals that will not harm the earth. So we allow them to do that. So again, these are three things that are allowed. You could be buried in a shroud. Uh, you could be buried in a wooden casket. You could be buried in a, a grass, straw, bamboo casket. So here's where we kind of de develop after, in the past, I mean, if you remember hearing um, the term boot hill for in the Wild West, it's because people were buried in shallow graves, and often you had the majority of the body in, but the boots stuck up. That's why it was called boot hill. It was natural, but it was natural burial. They didn't dig six feet down. They dug enough to get the body covered, and that was primarily so animals wouldn't get to it. Now, when we have um, the lawn cemetery, this is when, if you go to really, really old cemeteries, they are not smooth on top. You have to be careful how you walk. They're very rough, and that's because when you are put in the ground, either in a, some kind of a casket, the old-fashioned way and not embalmed, everything is going to deteriorate a lot faster than it would if it was embalmed. And so after about two years, the grave sinks, and they just allowed it to do that. That was the natural way of doing it. When the lawn cemetery came around, they wanted cemeteries to look more like parks. And so they wanted to uh, make it safe for people because people would go out on Sundays and sit in the cemetery because it was a lot of times the only green space that was maintained and people would picnic and people would spend the afternoon. Uh, they might wander around. You would sit around where your family plot was, and it was a normal thing to do on a Sunday. However, in order to keep it green and looking nice, you started using pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. Concrete vaults got um, acquired, and then, um, they also had uh, embalming came into this. So in the lawn cemetery, this is where it started affecting the environment. Prior to that, it was pretty normal. You didn't have anything going into the earth that wouldn't be totally reclaimed by the earth in a natural way. So, when you look at, so this would be considered what is normal burial today. So every year 
we put 4.3 million gallons of embalming fluid, um, which has formaldehyde. We're putting that into the earth. Um, how much hardwood that we chop trees down in order to make uh, the caskets. Sometimes, and you know, caskets can run 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, depending what they're made out of. So if you want mahogany, you have just chopped down some trees that you didn't need to. But, so it's depleting the forests. Um, you also have the concrete that goes in because of uh, the vaults, copper, bronze, steel, because again, people were thinking that that would protect them from that, that whole disintegration process. However, so that's the impact on the environment. But you also have worker safety issues, and this has really been uh, coming out in the last 10, 15 years. People who work with embalming fluid, uh, especially the high formaldehyde, they have a higher risk for leukemia because they're handling chemicals that are in a sense corrosive, but it affects them. Uh, also ALS, COPD, other neurological disorders. Uh, we know just practically from gardening, there have been things that have pulled off, been pulled off the market that we normally would even use in our gardens that uh, have been shown now that over time it builds up in our bodies and makes us sick. So if it's making us sick, it's also making the earth sick. So embalming, um, some of the myths are, it's not legally required. There is no law that says you must be embalmed before burial. Embalming, came about in order to protect people if the body was being shown for a viewing. Um, normal embalming will preserve the body for two weeks. After that, it starts to deteriorate just like any other body would. So it does not protect you from natural decay. Vaults are not legally required. Cemeteries have their own rules and make their own rules for how they maintain their sites. So if they have a vault policy, it's to make the mowing easier because um, if you are running, you know, those large lawn mowers, over areas that are not level, it actually breaks down the machines. So, and then also from an insurance perspective, if people are walking in the cemetery and it is not flat, it's the possibility that people will trip or fall a lot easier. But again, a vault does not protect your body from the decay process. So this is at resurrection, and this is what natural burial looks like for us. So we have a pathway, and you can see there's kind of a white section on the sidewalk, and it goes to a brown section. That brown section is starting the area that has, is designated as natural burial. We wanted to distinguish it to show that it is for the earth. The brown um, was more of an earthy color than the white concrete. We have, we have two entry stones. They're natural granite, come from Cold Spring, Minnesota. They are natural to Minnesota. 
So the name of our natural burial area is Gate of Heaven Preserve. Uh, it's a wildlife preserve as well as wildflower. Um, we are looking at doing um, more, I guess, planting that would be pollinator friendly. Even though the prairie is pollinator friendly, mm -hmm. I would like to have a section that is more uh, maybe a bee garden that would so to to help with um, the earth and the environment and also just in uh, making sure that our flowers are pollinated. The other stone is a quote by Pope Francis which talks about uh, the earth. In the heart of this world, the Lord of life, and I cannot read and I have my glasses, who loves us so much is always present. God does not abandon us. God does not leave us alone. For God has united himself definitively to our earth. And God's love constantly impels us to find new ways forward. Praise be to God. So what we have is that, I suppose I wanted to walk over here and point a couple things out. So this is our whole cemetery right here. This one section right now is designated for natural burial. This is the layout of that first section. So we, the area is, we are going to have a, a, a kind of a gate or trellis put in so that you physically feel like you are moving into another space. When you come in, we have an area that has um, a section, um, I want to say canopy, uh, there's another group. <coughs> Gazebo, that's the word, you win five dollars. <laughs> so we have a gazebo. Under that is a place for the family to gather. We usually process in the body, and I'll show you this a little bit later. The body is on a cart, it is moved in, comes under the gazebo, prayers are done there. And then it is um, taken on the cart to whatever section they have chose to be buried in. And then we have some um, concrete benches, not concrete, granite benches around that area. These areas down here are areas for reflection. So they'll have benches and people can come out and reflect. We, because the, uh, we are not maintaining these graves like we do in the rest of the cemetery, we tell people not to walk into any of these sections. And so we put in sidewalks so they could get to each of the sections. Our sections are named after saints. Some are biblical. Some are uh, modern, and then some are more historical. So we have, uh, we started out just with St. Francis and St. Clair. We thought it would take uh, five to 10 years to sell out that section or those sections. They were sold in a couple of months. So that there, there are no burial spaces left in St. Francis, St. Clair, uh, St. John the 23rd, St. Joseph. Um, I think we have half of Mary Magdalene left and half of Catherine Drexel. And I'm, I'm not sure about the others. So we found 
that people are very interested in going back to the earth naturally and leaving a lighter footprint on the earth just as we've been trying to do in our everyday lives. So think about how many of us recycle automatically. It's just what we do. How many, you know, are there people that do composting? Um, how, how are we, you know, when we purchase things, do we look for things that are in hard encased plastic or do we go for something that will be more biodegradable? There, we make these choices all the times in our lives. So now people want to make these same choices in death. So, as I said, the first two are St. Francis and St. Clair. Um, when we had the St. Clair stones brought in and placed, we had a deer visit right away and it was like, oh my gosh, it, it's a sign, just like we heard in uh, the preaching this morning. We had a sign. So what we do is that we have, again, natural boulders, um, have them s finished in a smooth or um, polished out on the front, but they're all from uh, Cold Spring, Minnesota, out of the granite mines. And we have the name of the section, and then each of our burial areas are in a grid system. So if you look on the right-hand side, you have the title on top, and then we have so many people that we can have in there. All we have on these uh, memorial folders are the name of the person, birth, and death date. If we would lay the boulder flat, you would be able to tell exactly where someone is buried. We also have posts in the ground that are labeled A, B, C, D, and then we have uh, some numbers running the other way, and uh, usually, you can figure out where the person is buried. We also locate each of these graves using GPS technology. So we are move, We are um, right now looking at upgrading our whole technology system. And so we're hoping that whatever we uh, decide to buy into, we'll be able to do GPS for every grave in all our cemeteries. So here's the process. The family um, funeral home and everything, they are on the road, they are outside our chapel mausoleum. The family takes the, uh, the body, whether it is casketed or shrouded, and places it in a cart. Now we had this cart um, handmade by someone, and it is because we want we wanted everything to be as natural. It is placed on the cart, and then because the cart is um, kind of unwieldy, if you are not used to moving a piece of equipment like this. We have our field staff take uh, the body to the gazebo. And then the family is following behind. So we have, as I said, the graves are dug four feet deep. What we need to do, because we, we have to have the information uh, from the funeral director before we can dig the grave, we need to know what is the width of the casket or the container, what is the length, and we need to know how many pounds everything is. Because depending on all that will depend on how you dig the grave. 
This oh, is sort sorry. of a snarky question, though. Do you dig it by hand, then, since you want to be natural? So we dig it with, it's a certain machine. And so it's we, a gas machine? Um, I think so, but I checked with the Green Burial Council, and they said because we're Minnesota, we that that is normal for Minnesota. Well, I know other places you're allowed to dig by hand if you're actually going green. Yes, so that's but why I said there's a variety of green. Every cemetery does the the green to the degree that they can handle. So, in for example, South Carolina. Well, we don't care about that. Well, except they dig automatically. They dig. Uh, the family digs the grave. That's part of how that cemetery does that. Um, I think that's all Scandinavian people dig their own. Oh, also. well, the only the two cemeteries that I'm most familiar with, um, which is the one in Brooklyn Center and ours, due to insurance reasons, we can't allow anyone to dig the the um, grave. We tried to look into that and then we told Green Burial Council that we are not allowed to dig our, our own graves and, and that especially in the winter we couldn't hand dig them even if we wanted to and they said that's okay you'll fall you'll fall under our guidelines for the state. So I don't know of any place in Minnesota uh, that allows you to dig your own graves where the family can do it. Now, I'm not saying there aren't, because I think smaller cemeteries sometimes will do that. They don't have the restrictions that larger, more public cemeteries do. But um, that's what we do. So the body is laid on slats of wood that are across the grave. Prayers can be, uh, the relatives are invited to move closer to the grave. If it's really nice out, we can do all the prayers right at gravesite. And then, again, we wanted to be able to let families uh, lower the casket or the body into the grave and were told we could not do that. And I could understand why. When we first opened this, I had our field staff practice with sandbags in lowering them into a grave. Um, we videoed it. It was very funny. They just could not get it. They had to figure out how to distribute the weight and how to lower. Now, my field staff is used to doing this. Family members would not be used to doing this. We lower by ropes, and then the ropes are dropped into the grave because they nat will also naturally decompose. So here's the, the guys. They have to lift the casket so they can pull the boards out and then lower with the ropes. And then that, the second one, is what it looks like. We allow people to place flowers or anything into the grave as long as it is naturally biodegradable. So it would not there would not be any ribbons, no wires, nothing metal. Um, it has to be able to uh, decay in a normal fashion and not harm the earth. We do allow the families to fill the grave as much as they can. Um, it's pretty hard work to do. So the family, usually everybody, takes a shovel full or two, but they don't even get the grave halfway filled. Uh, and then 
the rest of my field staff will hand fill it. We don't use any machines in filling it. Once, uh, oh, this is uh, prior, as I said, they can place flowers on top of the casket, or once the grave is uh, mounded, they can put flowers on top. We also give each family two packets of seeds, wild prairie flower seeds, uh, so that what they can come back in the spring and sprinkle those wildflower seeds over the grave, or they can take they can take one of the packets home if they want and do a memorial garden in their own yard with those, those same prairie wildflowers. So the grave remains mounded. We have found that it doesn't settle after a year like we were told it would. Um, I still can see the mounding from our first burial that we did three years ago. It's not as high as it was, but it hasn't gotten down to ground level. Eventually, if it sunk in very low, uh, my staff would put more uh, dirt on top and then sprinkle more flower seeds on top. And then we used uh, landscape, uh, the Prairie Restoration, uh, they actually put together huge bags of seeds that we could use that are all natural to um, Minnesota Prairie. So a big thing is, well, what about cremation? Cremation was supposed to uh, not harm the environment. A lot of people thought, well, okay, so I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that, uh, the, the big casket, and, and I'm not going to do embalming, and I'm not going to do the um, liner, the grave liner, where I'm not going to put all that stuff, I'm going to be cremated, and then um, it won't be taking up as much land. So. However, anyone that has studied science knows that there are things that are called physical change and chemical change. Physical change means that you could put something together and then pull it apart again and it would still look the same. It would have the same properties as it had before. Chemical change is when something is changed because of heat or another element and what happens is that it becomes something totally different. Well, that's what happens with cremation. Most of us, is wa we are uh, made up of mostly water. So in the cremation process, most of our body becomes water and, and gas and goes up and it goes into the air. What's left are bones, and we know bones are made up of a number of elements, calcium being a big one, but when you have uh, calcium exposed to heat, it becomes totally different. It is no longer calcium and magnesium and, and all those other elements. Uh, also, depending what you were exposed to in your lifetime, be it fertilizers or um, mercury was a big thing, I know. We used to play with mercury when we were kids. And now it's like, don't touch it. But I mean, there were a lot of things that we thought were normal to do, but actually it absorbed into our body. I have a brother who used to go in and rebuild and re work old, old houses and, and make them into looking like new houses, but with the, the same design. He had lead poisoning. It seeped into his blood because of, with the old houses, everything was lead paint. Well, 
now he has um, a brain injury because of it. So it's like things that we didn't know, we're finding out that our bodies carry all of this stuff with us. All of that is also released into the air. So uh, chemicals, everything else. So cremated remains are bones that have been processed into fine particles following the exposure to high heat. Um, there is no organic matter or bacteria left in the bone. Um, it doesn't change. So when people talk about scattering ashes, they think, well, I'm going to scatter them and they're going to go into the earth. They never go into the earth. They always remain the same. Uh, so you will have little bits of bones in your gardens because it will never be absorbed by the earth. It can't be. It's no longer something that the earth will uh, use. They don't decompose. One of the cemeteries here in the cities tried a scattering garden. So they did this gorgeous garden of plants and small trees, and they allowed people to scatter the cremated remains there. Everything died because it bas basically suffocated the earth. So it, it's nothing, it no, nothing can grow out of just the cremated remains themselves. So uh, if you want to uh, have cremated remains in some kind of a thing where you plant a tree, you can't just plant a tree or put seeds into a bag of cremated remains. It has to be mixed with uh, a certain uh, percent of compost, which actually has the material that the seed would absorb. It will not absorb anything from the cremated remains. So uh, they don't enhance plant life or any growth of any way. However, cremated remains are still the human body. It's just in a different form. Just like uh, there are ways to prepare a body, cremated, being cremated is one way to prepare the body, embalming is a way to prepare the body, natural burial without anything is a way of preparing the body, and uh, using a plant-based um, fluid instead of formaldehyde is another way to prepare the body. However, all four of these ways, you are still left with the body, and you need to do something with the body, either inter them or bury them. Um, but they're not going to keep, make your garden grow. So when cremation is used, they use um, high amounts of fossil fuel in order uh, which impacts the environment. Uh, anything that you have in your body, including mercury, is released into the air. Um, it is, you are not returning your body to its natural state because basically you've kind of chemically changed it. Um, I'm going to skip this and go to questions. I don't know how long I've talked. I just know I need a drink. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you're associated with Resurrection Cemetery in yes. Mendota Heights. It's in Mendota Heights. Mendota, Mendota Heights. Uh, is is uh, affiliated with Gethsemane in Newell? Yes, it is. Do they have plans to extend natural burial there? We can't. And the reason is Gethsemane is on, um, has a high water table. So no matter how far we dig down, it's affecting groundwater. Is there any plans for natural burial here in uh, Crystal, New Hope, Plymouth, Maple Grove area? I don't know. 
I can only speak from the cemeteries that I manage. So, um, not, not gonna happen I don't, you know, I don't know. Who knows what, I don't know what cemetery you have out here. Um, I did probably the closest one to you. Yeah, I'm familiar with Brooklyn Center. My sister-in-law was just naturally interred there last fall. <coughs> but that's the that's the only one. Just the two of us are the only ones in Minnesota that have been certified by the Green Burial Council. And I have, you know. Yes. So I know that there is information on your website about the cost and the comparison of the cost. But briefly, could you just talk about that? Because I know that the costs, according to the website, are the same. Okay. So, so if you're looking at okay, let's go to one person rather than two people. Because the first slide I showed you was for two people. So in natural burial, uh, you are paying for a grave. It is higher because of what we need to do to keep it up. We need to keep it, preserve it as a prairie. And it will, be, it will stay like that for till the end of time. That, that is part of it. And it's more expensive to go green sometimes, especially when you're beginning. However, and your grave opening and closing is because of the amount of physical labor it takes. So that is going to be higher than a, a single grave in the regular part of the cemetery. But you are not paying for the average casket cost is, is around $1,600. Um, the vault is $1,700. Your, um, if you are doing some kind of a foundation for some kind of a memorial stone, that is gonna cost you almost $400. And then a, a basic flat stone in a cemetery is approximately 1400 so to do this it is a little cheaper to go with natural burial but you're not going to see the big cost you're not going to see a big price difference it is more about how it affects the earth so people who come to us aren't usually coming because they think the price is going to be so much cheaper. They're coming because they don't want to harm the earth. They don't want to harm the environment. So it's the value over the dollar. Yes. Joan, thanks for your presentation. Very helpful. Uh, a lot of things that I haven't thought about before uh, and um, very useful from that point of view. There must be big pushback, though, from the funeral home industry on this. No. Or why, so I, this, because, on the surface, I would think they would be opposed. No, because um, just so uh, a lot of commentary around how funeral homes are slow to make changes, they learned the hard way with cremation. When a lot of funeral homes said, no, we are not handling cremation. So they learned that as um, things change in the world, they need to be on board. There's a lot, there's been a lot written in the last two years addressing funeral directors that you better have a way of helping people do green because it's the way they're living and it's what they want. And if you can't do that, they will go someplace where they will be able to get it. So, uh, so I know a number, I know there's a number of, uh, I know more of the funeral homes uh, kind of in the St. Paul area, but Gill Brothers out here does the green burial. Um, 
in uh, Willershide in St. Paul, O'Halloran and Murphy, oh, Dan uh, Delmore. Uh, they do. They were one of the first in the cities to embrace it. And in the beginning, when this was starting, I, I would have Dan come out and present with me um, how easy it is for funeral homes to do this. The only thing that would tend to be an issue with uh, some of the funeral homes is if uh, someone wants to be viewed. Sometimes you can't, you can hold on to formaldehyde in their containers and have it stored in the storage room. You can't do that for the plant-based uh, embalming fluid. It, it disintegrates too fast. So, uh, but they can get it within in less than 24 hours. Our dis, uh, distri distribution sites that will do that. But sometimes some funeral directors think well, that's just too much work, you know, that I have to do that. But not if they want to give the, the family who's coming to them what they want. So I'm not seeing a big pushback. In fact, I'm seeing more and more uh, funeral homes calling us and saying, okay, we have a burial at your place and it's natural burial and we don't know what to do. You know, some of them think that if you have a natural burial, you have to bury within three days. You don't. Uh, uh, a funeral home, once they receive a body, they have three days to bury that body if it is not embalmed. However, if they have refrigeration, they can refrigerate the body up to 10 days sometimes longer before the body needs to be buried. If, it, if, if you have the natural embalming, as I said, that holds the body for two weeks. And they can hold the body and refrigerate it, and it's not a problem. So a lot of uh, false information is still out there. I did put a question and answer insert into your packets. These are the questions we most likely get um, over time since we used to, anytime I get a new question, I update our Q&A to include that question. But we pretty much covered. Can you tell us what the average cost of this natural burial would be? Well, average cost for a single, yeah is about, it's 7,700, I need computer, I usually yes. have computer glasses, 75. Does that include so the grave? That's including the grave. So that's about $8,000. Yeah. Okay. Yes? What do you know about, and I've seen this, but I don't know what it's called, the body is put into a bag, it's buried in the ground, they put a tree on top of it. I've seen it. They're called um, pods, yeah. body pods. I don't know anyone who's used them out here. Uh, the West Coast usually starts some of these trends, um, and then eventually they move east. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody has, as far as I know, and the funeral directors that I've talked to, nobody's used them. Okay. But I think, I think it is another way. It's natural? It's natural as long as there's nothing in the body yeah. that, so, that, now, when I say nothing natural, for example, people say, well, you know, I have an artificial knee and an artificial hip. Does that mean I can't have natural burial? No. Um, that is part of your body at that time. Can't so, yes, no polyester. <laughs> <laughs> you know if they can reuse any of those steel parts, knees, hip joints, whatever? No, they actually um, recycle them and melt them down. Okay. So even if you go for cremation, they take, all, first of all, you can't, they have to remove 
the pacemaker, because that will explode. But anything else after cremation, they remove any wires and parts like that, and they have a, a special place that they put them, and they ship them back to um, a place where everything's melted down. Thank you so much for all these great questions. And for Joan, that was a, a really a great we, We've learned a lot today, and I know a lot of us will go home and think about this. I wanted to remind you that in this packet is Joan's business card with the website and her contact information. She is a wealth of information, is passionate about this, as we can hear from her. And I think she would welcome any more questions if you have them later on. So spread the word, let your friends know this is online. There will be packets available in the church office. If somebody didn't attend, they can come into the church office and Joan brought us extra to hand out to people. So and thank you, you so If you ever want a tour, come out after the spring rains. I'd be happy to give you a tour of our area. It's worth it. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you.